Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, the program begins now. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome again to Halifax. Welcome to the annual Halifax Address. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished speaker who is with us here today, and that is the commander of Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral John Accolino. As was previewed yesterday in the discussion with General Clark, the Indo-PACOM Theater presents among the most critical complex and consequential challenges covering 36 nations, 14 time zones, and more than 50% of the world's population. Admiral Aquilino has been in the seat for approximately seven months and has a distinguished, and I would say remarkable, uh, career in the United States Navy that includes a number of critical assignments around the world. Commander Pacific Fleet, Commander US Naval Forces CENTCOM, Commander Carrier Strike Group 2, time at Fleet Forces Command and the Atlantic Fleet, and service, of course, as an aviator, F-14, F-18, command of the famous Red Rippers, and deployments in support of Iraqi Freedom, Southern Watch, Enduring Freedom, and others. He is a graduate degree in physics, U.S. Naval Academy, Peter, I was told there's going to be no math here today, but uh, I digress. And also the Top Gun School, as well as the Joint Forces College. He holds the Distinguished Service Medal, the Defense Superior Service Medal, Legion of Merit, Bronze Star, and other awards and decorations. And perhaps most relevant and important to the forum, he is from a border state, a native of Hunting, Huntington, rather, New York. Admiral, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thanks, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador, thank you very much. Uh, when I listen to it, I always wish my mom was in the room because 
For those who know me, they're not impressed, but I know she would be very thankful, sir. I appreciate it. It's an honor to, to spend time with you. Uh, Ambassador McCain, thank you very much for today. It was really wonderful to talk last night and this morning. Uh, your efforts honor the legacy of Senator McCain. Uh, it was my privilege and honor to work with him in previous jobs as well. Thank you for everything you do. Uh, I also need to thank Peter and the Halifax team for putting on this wonderful event and doing it in person. Uh, with the proper precautions to keep people healthy, uh, it's a tremendous event. Thank you for the hospitality and the warm welcome. And to my brother, Wayne, thank you. It's good to see you. Uh, unbelievable distinguished crowd. Uh, Madam President, if you're still in here. Uh, distinguished senators, members of parliament, members of the diplomatic corps, distinguished flag officers, Again, my battle buddy, Rich, uh, my other battle buddies standing over here. It's great to spend time with you and to all the service members that are here. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very, very much. OK, this morning, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the significance of the Indo-Pacific. And how the current rules based international order, and I say current because it's been here for 80 years. It's still here. And it's done everything designed for all nations, enabling peace, security, stability, and prosperity for all globally around the globe. And I also want to talk a little bit about these international norms that are currently under direct assault. Two important points that I'd like you to just keep in the back of your mind how vital the Indo-Pacific is to the global security and prosperity, and second, the absolute necessity for all nations to defend that rules-based international order for their benefit and for the benefit of all. So 20 years ago, the relative military and economic situations that we exist today are much different. We adapted to a post-Cold War environment and we presented with a focus on terrorism. Now, in the past two decades, I would make the argument the military and economic centers of gravity have shifted to the Indo-Pacific. The region hosts four of the most populous nations, three largest democracies, three largest economies. It's responsible for 60% of the world's gross domestic product. Two thirds of the present global economic growth is driven from the Indo-Pacific. Now, militarily, seven of the world's 10 largest armies, five of the world's declared nuclear nations, the most sophisticated navies all reside in the Indo-Pacific. The sea lanes support the world's nine largest ports. And every day, half of the global container cargo and 70% of the shipborne energy supply flows through those maritime spaces. Now, it didn't happen by itself. The rules-based international order facilitated this dramatic growth and its development. The important work of the regional nations in the Indo-Pacific fostered an environment for all to prosper. Adherence to those international norms and our other values to include mutual respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, human rights, resolving disputes peacefully, and freedom of navigation all have created greater stability. So when we talk about economics, let me give you a couple of examples of what occurred in the past 20 years. Singapore has quadrupled its GDP since 2001. Indonesia has reduced poverty levels by 50% in the past 20 years. So when we talk about the Indo-Pacific being important, it is. 
It's not an anomaly. And the entire world has benefited from that rules-based international order. So, as I stated, that is under attack. Revisionist autocratic powers seek to disrupt and displace the current system in ways that benefit themselves at the expense of all others. Coercion, intimidation, those are the tools they use to achieve their objectives. And they use the theme of might equals right to justify their actions. Some examples. And we'll talk a lot today about deeds and not words. There's a lot of things that are said. Let me give you some examples of the deeds. Self-created domestic law with an attempt to portray it as the common international law. Illegal and excessive maritime claims based on revisionist history. And just the other day, and even more alarming, law enforcement entities taking physical action in the form of water cannons to harass vessels operating in international waters. Directly infringing upon the freedom of navigation guaranteed under international law, and luckily, no one was hurt. That could have been very different. These are the actions that clearly contrast with the peace and stability that we've been uh, able to enjoy for over 80 years. This assault on the rules-based international order should be concerning to all of us. Now, on a positive note, the vast majority of countries throughout the region and the globe continue to strive for a free and open Indo-Pacific. This is the defining security landscape of the 21st century. And how we deal with this will matter. What happens in the Indo-Pacific does not necessarily stay in the Indo-Pacific. And it impacts the entire world. So, what are we going to do about it? Many today and yesterday have talked about the importance of like-minded nations and allies and partners working together. And it's critical. And we'll talk about that for now for a little bit. Right now for a little bit. If we don't execute in accordance with the international rules-based order, and we highlight the importance, and we highlight the fact that we will not bend, those are the ways we get after it. Prime Minister Churchill and President Roosevelt intended just that when they signed the Atlantic Charter in Newfoundland 80 years ago. The agreed to international order, and I'll stress agreed to. Many of the nations who are attacking the rules-based international order agreed to it and benefited from it for these last 80 years. And success was achieved through prosperity and common values. So, security relationships, and what do those allies and partnerships look like in the Indo-Pacific? Well, might be in the form of five bilateral treaty alliances as it looks through the lens of the United States. The member states of the NATO alliance. Mature multilateral forums, strategic partnerships, multi and minilateral engagements, all apply. And these vast and diverse and multiple agreements and partnerships will help ensure the freedom of access to the global commons. In May, Secretary of Defense Austin introduced the concept of integrated deterrence. Let me give you the definition as I understand it. 
Integrated deterrence is the synchronization of all forms of national power together with the joint force in all domains with our allies and partners to preserve peace, stability, and the international rules-based order. So let me translate what that definition looks like in execution. Just a month ago, seven nations came together with four big deck aircraft carriers to operate in international waters and to ensure that that space was open for all. 15,000 sailors and Marines, Canada, Netherlands, UK, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, and the United States. Or it looks like this. The Canadians in the United States transiting through the international sea space of the Taiwan Strait. Or how about the French-led exercise La Perouse with combinations from naval assets from Australia, France, India, Japan, and the United States. Or how about the deployment of the German flagship Bayern participating throughout her deployment with the Coalition of Nations, enforcing the UN Security Council resolutions uh, associated with the Korean issue. And soon to come this year, how about the largest maritime and land exercise in one place known as the Rim of the Pacific in Hawaii? More than 25 nations, maritime, air, and land forces coming together to include many, if not all, of the ASEAN nations. United States Marines, F-35 squadrons flying off the British carrier Queen Elizabeth. So when we talk about integrated deterrence and we link it to with allies and partners, that's what it looks like. We talked a lot about maritime, but it is the entire joint force. These activities increase our capabilities together, they improve interoperability, and they strengthen the trust between our, these like-minded nations. And they ensure that the air, maritime, cyber, and space domains remain open to all. So when viewed by those who seek to change the international rules-based order, these activities provide clear, visible evidence that we will not accept anything except a free and open Indo-Pacific. This collaboration proves what can be achieved when allies and partners work together. And individually, we are strong but together, we are stronger. So as we go into the future, we need to continually confront these challenges. I talk often about thinking, acting, and operating differently, and this is a pretty good example of what that looks like. So what are some other things that can take us forward? We talked about the different security architectures of ASEAN and uh, those others across the region. AUKUS is a great example of what right looks like. Non-traditional partners coming together in this region to ensure peace and stability. Operating in new ways that demonstrates how our allies and partners will significantly impact the region. The Quad. Now, while that's not a military alliance, it is the connection of like-minded nations across ep economic, diplomatic, informational, and military domains. So militarily, the example of Exercise Malabar is a great one. Twice this year operating both uh, in the Philippine Sea and in the Bay of Bengal. Those, these four countries came together 
to increase our capability, interoperability, and ultimately enhance deterrence. The trilateral relationship of the United States, Japan, and Korea is extremely important. Recently, North Korean missile launches challenge the safety of all in the region, and those three nations operate persistently to defend the United States homeland, the Korean Peninsula, and the Japanese homeland. Now, we have more work to do. I told you Secretary Austin talked about integrated deterrence. Couple of key words in there are all domains. So when we talk about our efforts, we do have more work to do. We need to strengthen our bilateral cybersecurity, space, and informational security together. We do a lot of uh, work against disinformation and misinformation. This safeguards all of our advantages. Now, the challenges I discussed today are primarily in the physical domain, as we just discussed. But we do need a concerted effort to increase resiliency, strengthen capabilities, and better integrate the cyberspace and informational domains. So, if you think about integrated deterrence, let me tell you what it produces. A geographically distributed, operationally resilient, defense in depth, focused, and a sustainable force posture that is coordinated globally with allies and partners and effectively employed every day. Not episodically, every day. So, great nations lead towards a compelling vision of the future. Like-minded nations believe in assured access to the global commons for the benefit of all countries, large and small, all with equal voices, and the opportunity to pursue greater levels of prosperity. None of us can do this by ourselves. We must work together. The Indo-Pacific Command is active, actively taking steps to strengthen those alliances and to build new ones. To develop relationships, strengthen them. Integrate our forces into a broader network of partnerships. And it's important for all nations to demonstrate their commitment to upholding this rules-based international order that's so important. And I'd like to encourage all of our allies and partners globally to continue to deploy to the Indo-Pacific. We are welcoming all comers. All the nations welcome your participation. And we will seek out new opportunities to contribute to this integrated deterrence. Please come and play. I'd like to thank uh, the Halifax team for putting this together. Uh, I appreciate the chance to share my ideas, and I look forward to speaking with many of you at the breaks and to listen to the follow-on panels. It's been enlightening. Once again, I'd like to thank you for your ability to participate and for you to take some time to listen. Thank you very much. <laughs>